to ask questions, they can just uh, unmute and uh, ask. And so I will first start the recording. Recording in progress. Okay, so we will now have the third lecture of uh, Kevin Costello on uh, topological aspects of uh, string theory. Please go ahead. Okay, uh, thank you very much. So, um, firstly, apologies again for the the technical difficulties yesterday. I'm pretty confident things are going to be okay today. Um, so let me just you know, verbally remind you of what we discussed last time. So we we saw that there were chiral algebras associated to superconformal field theories, n equals two supersymmetry, and we wrote them down explicitly for n equals four Yang mills, in which case we had two adjoint valued scalars in our chiral algebra, and a certain family of SEFTs with SO8 flavor symmetry. And in that case, we had two, uh, two matrix valued fields and one vector, sorry, eight vectors rotated by the SO8 symmetry. And we also discussed a little bit about the topological string, which we propose would be holographically dual. So today, we're gonna to study the back reaction in the topological string. At least that's the first thing we'll study. So last time we also, we wrote down the field sourced by a brain in the topological string. This was a certain Beltrami differential. We solved that equation. <clears throat> The geometric role of a Beltrami differential is that it changes the Cauchy Riemann equations. So, in our case, in the deformed geometry, the original coordinates were W1, W2, and Z. And here, the new Cauchy Riemann equations are these equations here which tell us what does it mean to be a holomorphic function in the deformed geometry. So let's solve these equations and then we'll find that the deformed geometry is ADS3 times S3. Let's go up a little bit. So, If we look at the equation, nowhere in the equation is there a d by dw1. So w1 and w2, these are still solutions to these deformed cauchy riemann equations. So these still define holomorphic functions. However, if we look in the equation, we see that there's a d by dz. So the function z will no longer be holomorphic. You can instead see that there are two new holomorphic functions, which I've called u1 and u2 here, given by these expressions. u1 is zw1 plus n over normal w squared w bar 2, and u2 is something similar. And it will take you half a minute to stick u1 and u2 into these equations and check that these equations are solved. So W1, W2, U1 and U2 are the holomorphic functions in the new geometry. However, they're not independent. As you can see, U1, W2 minus U2, W1 is equal to N. <clears throat> Which is again, entirely elementary. So we conclude that the deformed geometry is that defined by this equation. 
So we can think of this as the space of two by two matrices like this with column vectors u1, u2, w1, w2, whose determinant is n. Now I can absorb the factor of n into a rescaling of some of the coordinates. So you might as well think of this as matrices whose determinant is one, so that the geometry is SL2C. Okay, so this is, this is our, the topological string derivation of the back reaction. And um, for the experts, I wanna point out that this is a little simpler than what normally happens in the physical string because we don't have to pass to any near horizon limit. Once we back react, the geometry always already has a homogeneity, which means passing to the near horizon limit does nothing. Okay. Well, are there any questions about this computation? No. Okay, so let's, so our goal is of course to compare the chiral algebras we've been discussing to quantities built from the topological string in this deformed geometry. So if we go back to think about the more familiar ADS5 times S5 holographic dictionary, the very easiest thing you might see is that in ADS5 times S5, the symmetries of the CFT are the same as the isometries of the geometry. This is, a, this is a very basic and elementary check, the ADS CFT correspondence. So, well, the isometries of ADS5 times S5 are SO6 times SO42. And here, SO6, that's, that rotates the six scalars, n equals four Yang nodes. And SO4, comma two, that's the conformal symmetries of the fourth sphere. And the symmetries of the fourth sphere, which preserve the metric of the available scaling. So because it's a CFT, these are symmetries of n equals four young mills on the fourth sphere. So what we're gonna do <clears throat> in the twisted holography setting is we're going to, to check that this statement holds. But, but what we will find is that it's a much richer statement for us because the group of symmetries will, will become infinite dimensional. And therefore will give us a very, very strong constraint. So before we move on, let me explain briefly how to think about the symmetries in the case of the CFT in a more abstract language. Your CFT will have a certain number of conserved charges, especially in a chiral CFT, any operator gives you a conserved charge. I integrate it around a circle, that's my conserved, conserved charge. However, we're interested in those conserved charges which preserve the vacuum at zero and at infinity like that. So if I take my charge and it around the three sphere and I hit it with the vacuum at zero, I get zero, similarly with the vacuum at infinity. So the, think of these as the initial and final states. So maybe. So I'll add, add another page. Why is, so why is this a good thing to do? So charges like this, preserve 
all correlation functions. So I have a picture like this where I have local operators. And if I sum over integrating a charge around the local operators, that's going to have the same effect by change of counter argument as integrating the charge around all of them. That's going to be zero because it is the same as integrating my charge against the vacuum against at infinity. <clears throat> okay, so we'll come in a minute, we'll come back to calculating these chart, these symmetries in the CFT side. So, so back to the topological string side. What will be the analog of the isometries? Well, we know that you know, general relativity is covariant under diffeomorphisms. And of course, diffeomorphisms are the gauge symmetries of, of general relativity. And I, the isometries are those gauge symmetries which preserve the field configuration you start with, like they preserve the vacuum field configuration, which, you know, the metric on ADS5 times S5. So the kind of thing we, we, we will study that will replace isometries will be gauge symmetries preserving the vacuum field configuration. So let's study what that is. Let's look in the type one case. So the fields, well, the solutions to the equations of motion more precisely, in the closed string sector, there's a complex structure and a holomorphic volume form. In the open string sector, we have an SO8 bundle, like a holomorphic SO8 bundle. So what are the gauge transformations of this data? Well, for the complex structure, that's really a part of the metric. So the gauge transformations are, are diffeomorphisms. Those which preserve the vacuum field configuration though, because we don't have all of the components of the metric, we're not just looking at isometries, we're looking at um, those diffeomorphisms which preserve the complex structure. And they also have to preserve the volume form. So, at an infinitesimal level, diffeomorphisms are given by vector fields. So these are holomorphic and divergence free vector fields on SL2C. So if you're familiar with complex geometry, you might notice that this is a very, very, very large Lie algebra. And we're going to see it that it also appears in the CFT side. <clears throat> Something that's a little easier to study is what happens for the open string fields in the type one string. There we have, you know, our gauge field describes a holomorphic bundle on, on the manifold. So those gauge transformations, which preserve the holomorphic structure of the bundle, are not constant, but rather they satisfy this equation. So the gauge transformations are holomorphic maps from SL2C to SO8. So again, this is a very big space because there are lots of holomorphic functions on SL2C. So these Lie algebras are infinite dimensional. So our goal today is to find these Lie algebras in the chiral, uh, inside the chiral algebra as symmetries which preserve the vacuum at zero and infinity. 
I have a question. So, yeah. So since uh, SL2C is non-compact, is there some uh, condition on the um, holomorphic vector fields at infinity that one has to impose? No, no, you, you look at all of them. Okay. So that's why it's so A. Uh, okay, so let me try to write a little more explicitly what the open string algebra is. We're looking at holomorphic functions from SLTC to the Lie algebra SO8. So what kind of thing is that? An element of it can be look, is gonna look like product of an element of SO8. A is an adjoint index for SO8 and a holomorphic function on SL2C, which is a function of the variables ui, wy, modulo the equation u1, w2 minus u2, w1 is n. So let's look at the quantum numbers of these symmetries. How do they transform under the natural kind of evidence symmetries one has? Well, of course, under the global SO8, these expressions live in the adjoint representation. What's more interesting is to think about how these expressions live under the left and right action of SL2 on itself. So the group SL2 acts on the left and the right by matrix multiplication. So on the CFT side, we also have those two SL2 actions. The left one is the global conformal symmetry, rotate CP1. So this is kind of the analog of SL42. And the right one, it rotates, you know, in our theory, we have two matrices and they have a symmetric row. This right action rotates those matrices. So this is the analog of SO6. Now, how does a function on the group behave under the action of left and right multiplication? Well, fortunately, there is an old theorem from the 1920s or something, which tells us this. This is really just harmonic analysis of the group, or the compact group, if you like. But it says that every holomorphic function can be expanded to modes, and the modes live in the tensor product of the spin J representation on the left with the spin J representation on the right. So our symmetries are then in a joint of SO8, tensor spin J on the left, spin J on the right. Okay, and so we should keep this in mind because we want to reproduce this from the CFT side. Well, what we want to identify the algebras we see on the topological string of the CFT, we also want to identify them not just as vector spaces, but also the structure constants of those algebras. So let's write down some structure constants as well, and then we'll see if we can reproduce them on the CFT side. Oops, I know that comes later, sorry. Ah, take that back. I will discuss the structure constants later. So what we'll do now is find symmetries with exactly these quantum numbers in the CFT. So how does that work? So if you remember in the CFT, the elementary fields are eight vectors, and two matrices. And these matrices have certain symmetry properties. 
And the gauge invariant operator is going to be interested in the single trace ones are vector, bunch of matrices, vector. Because of the symmetry properties of x1 and x2, this expression is anti-symmetric in the ORS indices, so that it's in the adjoint of S08. And under the conformal symmetry for the CFT, this is an expression of spin m, m plus n over 2 plus 1, because the i's, i's and the x's are all of spin half. Now, it also lives in some representation of the SO2, which rotates x1 and x2. And it's in the representation of spin m plus n over 2 of that SO2. So we've, you know, that is, we've listed the open string operator and which representations it lives in. But to reproduce the quantum numbers we saw on the holographically dual side, we should recall that we're not interested in all operators or all modes of operators. Rather, we're interested in those modes that preserve the vacuum at zero and infinity. So this picks out a subalgebra of all of the modes. Um, some people call this the wedge algebra. So how is this defined? If I take the contour integral of some operator, I take some mode, you ask, okay, when does this preserve the vacuum at zero? For that, you need k to be positive, like non-negative, because if k was negative, then I hit it with the vacuum at zero, I'm gonna get some derivative of my operator. And then you ask, does it preserve the vacuum at infinity? Well, we change coordinates, z goes to one over z, and I pick up some powers of z, from the way the operator transforms, which is dictated by its spin. And you find it preserves the vacuum at infinity if k is in this range, or j is the spin of my operator. So for example, uh, if I have a spin one operator, then only that is in the algebra. Um, sorry, I think I need a... Page to explain this. So spin one, like an ordinary current, Ja, So the globe, no, if I have a spin one operator, maybe it satisfies a Casnudi OPE, then the global symmetries will be a finite dimensional, dimensional Lie algebra. If I have a spin two, like the stress energy tensor, then this constraint tells me that, you know, we have naught less than equal to K, Thus, we're equal to 2 j minus 1. And if j is 2, we have, OK, is not 1 or 2. So for spin 2 operator, like the stress energy tensor, the global symmetries are the SL2 global conformal transformations. As you increase the spin of the operator, you get more and more global symmetries. So let's go back a little bit and see what are the global symmetries of associated to our basic currents. Yeah. Our basic currents are I, X1 to the N, X2 to the N, I. 
Well, if you look at the spins, we see k is allowed to be in the range from 0 to m plus n. So these expressions, they're in the adjoint of s away, of course. And they're in a representation of spin m plus n over 2 with respect to both the SL2 conformal symmetry and the SL2 symmetry, which rotates x1 and x2. So this is the same quantum numbers as we saw before. It's like sum SO8 tensor EJL tensor EJR. <clears throat> If there are no, are there, are there any questions there? No. Okay. okay, so, so what have we seen so far? On the topological string side, we looked at the analog of isometries, we found this big algebra maps from SL2C to SO8. And on the um, CFT side, we looked at those modes which preserve the vacuum at zero and infinity, and we found something which looks the same. At least something that has the same quantum numbers. Um, I haven't explained how to calculate the quantum numbers of the closed string operators, but it's not hard to check that they also match. So what we haven't done so far is match the structure constants of these Lie algebras. So, the way it's going to work is that here T is some element of SO8. I'm writing this for R and S are vector indices for SO8, and things are anti symmetric at R and S. So holomorphic functions from SL2C to SO8, they look a little like this. At the lowest level, I just have those constant functions here, which are these. Then I have those functions which are linear in the coordinates, TRS UI and TRS WI. These are going to get sent to IXI. Or the distinction between the UI and the WI is whether or not there's a Z, DZ, or just a DZ. And the same happens as you go down. So next, so we need to be able to match the non-trivial commutators. So let's examine one of these commutators. For example, if I take <clears throat> TRS times U1, TPQ times W2, and I commute them, all I'm doing is I'm taking the S weight commutator of these matrices. These are you know, anti-symmetric matrices. I'm just commuting them. And then I'm multiplying the functions. In particular, if I specialize these indices to particular values, you find T12 U1, T23 W2 is U1 U2, U1 W2 T13. Similarly, T12 U2, T23 W1 is U2 W1 T13. But now we should, we should recall that SL2C is as a defining relation for U1 W2 minus U2 W1 is equal to N. So we get such a relation in the commutator like this. 
So this is the relation we're going to want to match. So let's translate this into the CFT language. U1 is going to be a mode with of x i1, x1, i2, like this. And w2 will be like this, an x2 and a z. And the other commutator, there's going to be an x2 with no z and an x1 with a z. And we expect that the modes commute according to this relation. And we're going to do this computation in a minute. And we find it works. But what I find kind of cool about it is that it's a way. Here we're just doing some computations in the mode algebra of the CFT, and we're seeing the holomorphic functions on the dual geometry up here, like the defining relations. Okay, so let's let's go and do this computation. So before we do so, I think I should remind people of something pretty elementary about how how one does um, how do you commute elements of the mode algebra of some chiral algebra. So in general. If I have two operators in a 2D CFT, O1 and O2, I can take their modes with some powers, e to the k1, z to the k2, and I can try to commute them. So the commutator is just the difference between two contour integrals, where here on this contour, on this contour here, O1 is on the inside, and O2 is on the outside. In this counter here, O2 is on the inside and O1 is on the outside. Now, when I take the difference between those two contour integrals, you can write it as a contour integral where here, O1 moves around in a circle and O2 orbits around O1. So to write that in coordinates, we're going to do a contra integral of z, just going around in a circle, and a contra integral of w, also going around in a circle, but O2 is placed at z plus w. And then I also have to have this power of z plus w to the k2. Okay. Now, when we do the w contra integral, what kind of non-zero terms can we find? Well, of course, so we're only going to find terms which have a power of 1 over w, because you want to get a residue. Expanding this expression will give us positive powers of w, and the OPEs here will give us negative powers of w. So we see that the terms that are relevant are the terms in the OPE, which have a first order pole, second order pole, to a pole of order k2 plus 1. Okay. In our case, we're doing a commutator of something here where there's no powers of z and something here where there's one power of z. So by this argument, the commutator will have terms from where there's a first order pole in the OP between the two operators or a second order pole. Now, in our CFT, each, the OPEs involving a pair of elementary fields always has a first order pole. So like a wick contraction contributes a first order pole. Since we want a first or second, we find that the, the relevant terms involve two wick contractions. So, Let's write out diagrammatically everything that involves two with contractions. Here, I can contract 
x1 with x2. But this is bad because this is a non-planar diagram. So since we're looking to CFT in the planar limit, this will not contribute. I can contract I1 and I2. That's good and that contributes this expression to the commutator of the modes, or I can contract x1 and x2 and i1 and i2, so, and i2 and i2. And this will contribute something with an n, and i1 this should be an i3. This will contribute n i1 i3. And the reason for the n is in the usual large n combinatorics, when I have a loop like this, when I have a loop like this here, it contributes a factor of n from like the trace in that loop. So I think, so now we've pretty much gone through the proof. If I commute these guys, I get I1, X1, X2, I3, Z, DZ, and a factor of N. For the other guy, for the other one, you find the same thing and minus N, I1, I3. So you find pretty much the same thing except for an extra sign. So we see in the algebra, the analog of the commutation relation of the defining relation of SL2C by commuting the modes past each other. Uh, okay, so this is really easy, but fun. So, any questions? Okay. So, how does it work more generally? So the theorem is that the, the global symmetry algebras for the planar CFT at the topological string are isomorphically algebras, even when you include the closed string sector. So let me say a little bit about this. So at the general case, Maybe I can ask you a question, actually. Sure, yeah. So on the chiral algebra side, uh, if I understand correctly, we don't have to take large n, right? We can understand this chiral algebra at finite n, even small n. Um, where do we see the need for a large n to, to match with the topological string? I mean, what would, I mean, here we had a match, but we've, uh, dropped the, the one over n corrections, the non planar diagrams. So, so where do, would we see those, those corrections? Right, so this gets into things which are a little tricky but possible to do. With, um, involving, you, you can try to com compute by various methods. So the diagram I'm be dropped looks like this. And these are contracted here. Um, but these go off like that. So it's like a two to two scattering process. I've not, sorry, I haven't drawn it very well. Uh, 
that's the best way to draw it. Um, and one can compute. So there are one loop corrections to the OPE in the topological string. And these capture it. So it is possible to see it, but it's a little tricky. So I, I think in general, you know, I, I like to be optimistic and think that loop corrections and the topological string side should be much more accessible than they are in the physical string. And I think they are, but they're still not easy. And probably the best way to approach them is to note that they're very tightly constrained by crossing symmetry. Okay, thanks. Um, of course, the other way, uh, and Lord Dan appears, is that there are trace relations. And I don't know how to see those in the topological string at all. Okay, so in general, statement is that if I take some kind of open string thing like this, the planar ones, I have to contract a bunch of adjacent stuff. Some other ones go off. That. This is a two to one kind of open string process. In CFT, that if we're looking at the global symmetry algebra, that this matches the Lie algebra, polymorphic maps, from SL to Z to SO8. And similarly, on the closed string side, we take modes of this guy in the global symmetry algebra. match vector fields, holomorphic diversions free, vector fields on SL2C. So how would we prove this? So for the open swing side, we're done. Because the algebra is generated by TA, TA UI, TA WI. So really, once we've checked this commutation relationship, relation, algebra, basically the Jacobian entity, 
so on. tells us the two algebras must be the same. Well, what about the toll string set? That's gonna be much more challenging. On the CF, it's more challenging to do the CFT computations. We're going to use the following tr trick. Vector fields on SL2C are derivations. of functions on s to c And so of, we're gonna use this symbol for functions. And so there's symmetries of this Lie algebra. And on the CFT side, you can kind of see explicitly why the closed string fields have to be symmetries. If I take a closed string field like this, the commutator of this with an open string field looks like into these go past, this kind of thing. And you can check this kind of, well, this is compatible with the Jacobi entity. Uh, so I've kind of very briefly sketched why the argument we just gave, well, very simple. It is enough to allow us to constrain just using algebra all of the symmetries and to see that for the closed string side too, we also get vector fields on SL2C. Okay, so the topic I haven't talked about so far, let's see, which I'm gonna to have to go spend more time on tomorrow is states from the point of view of holography of the topological string. So in general, ADS CFT our fields have an asymptotic boundary condition on ADS. So suppose we write ADS and Euclidean signature as like the upper half plane, then Roughly, there's the fields one wants to consider have some prescribed 
pole in the radial parameter or. So a local operator is a modification of this asymptotic boundary condition at a point on the boundary. So, which means away from this point, we're going to have usual asymptotic behavior. And at this point, we're going to have modified. That's not a behavior. So I don't know if this is a familiar picture to people, but it relates to the more standard one by saying that So equivalently, if we modify the boundary conditions, we can find a solution to the equations of motion with the modified boundary condition. So this solution to the equations of motion is the state on ADS corresponding to a CFT operator. So I want to explain how to implement this um, in the case we're considering of SL2C. So to understand this, we need to, to think about what does SL2C look like near its boundary? SL2C is like U1, W2 minus W2, U1 equals N. That's up. So to understand the boundary, Let's make these into homogeneous coordinates. And then the, the equation will be U1 W2 minus W2 U1 equals N uh, E squared. So now, I'm lifting everything into homogeneous coordinates and then writing SL2C as an open subset of a quadric in CP4 as I'm imposing this quadratic equation. So, you know, just like it started life as a solution of a quadratic equation in C4. And I'm adding on some points at infinity to C4 to get CP4. Then I want to see what the boundary of SL2C is in this compactification. The boundary divisor is a locus where V is zero, in which case the equation looks like 
U1, W2 minus W2, U1 is zero. This is a quadric in CP3. Um, well, as you might have seen in Anna's lectures, this is kind of standard in the study of scattering. <clears throat> Quadrics in CP3 are parameterized by CP1 times CP1. So the boundary looks like S2 times S2. Now, should we think of this? Well, it is three times S3 is S two C. The boundary So one S2 is the boundary for ADS3. The other is, well, almost the S3, it's S3 modulo U1. So they're related by a half vibration. I didn't get very far with the discussion of states. So I told you what, what it means to get a state. We're going to modify the boundary conditions. Now we've studied the boundary of SL2C and we find it's a product of two CP1s. So the next thing to do is to look at the boundary conditions and to see that modifications of the boundary conditions do indeed give you the states of the dual CFT. And then after that, we can study, we can try to study scattering amplitudes and match them with correlation functions. Uh, okay, so I'll, I'll stop there. Thank you very much. Thank you.